This, my friends, is authentic kangaroo testicle leather. And what strikes me is that if you fill a testicle kangaroo pouch with golf balls, you've quite literally made an honest-to-goodness ball sack. So yeah, leather is a fascinating material, and I want us to break it down together. If you come to the conclusion that someone has leather, that they are wearing leather of some kind, two questions get derived from that. How have they acquired or fabricated the leather? And second of all, um, what kind of animals would be giving them the leather, you know? Like in the case of Horizon, um, you know, as to not to compete with the giant machines, going all the way throughout the world, um, but also to give people stuff to clothe themselves in and eat. Uh, there are animals out in the world of Horizon, but they're all very, very small. Um, essentially, the biggest animal is, I don't know, something like a pig or something. I'm not quite sure which one that we can kill within the game there. That is the biggest one, but I think it's like something like that. It's like a pig. Uh, and so characters could only wear pigskin, let's say. Um, and pigskin would give them the, the biggest areas, but it still means that, you know, because you're talking about a relatively small animal compared to, let's say, leather that would come from a cow, that you still have to create clothings where you have to separate the clothings in multiple little pieces often. So let's break down leather a little bit based off of everything that we've said. So for me, when I think of a great reference for leather, I think of a site called Leather Dictionary. I've shared a few things about that site in the past uh, when we were talking about leather previously a few weeks ago there. Um, but it cannot be understated that this website is quite literally, should be renamed to Leather Encyclopedia, or Le Leather Bible almost. It's like um, this website has all the information you could ever want about leather any sort of way, you know, like I haven't found something that I was wondering about leather for which I wasn't able to find the answer on this particular website. So this is a great place to go to and to really read. And you can spend so much time just going through this, you know. Just looking at this particular video that's on the website, you already start to see that uh, different animals will give you very different type of details on the surface of the leather there, right? This is, I think this is inside a stomach there. This is stomach leather that we're looking at. And look at the patterns that's getting created there. Look at like the, the, the nice kind of cellular Voronoi-ish pattern that's in there. It's really, really awesome. It's a bit gross too, but uh, there's no denying that it's very original and very interesting to like look at, right? And like, you realize that every animal gives leather that has a different type of pattern to it over the surface in the tertiary details. One of the crazier ones for me is this one here. So ostrich leather, because you can literally see all the places where the feathers was within the bird there. So the question of uh, which animals would have been sourced for the leather that you have over your character is already a very interesting one um, and can already lead to differentiating uh, and creating details. If anything, it should serve as a great source of inspiration for you. An animal skin is actually very thick. Um, and uh, especially like if you have like cow leather, you know, like cow skin is actually quite, quite thick, right? So uh, at some point there has to be a reduction in uh, thickness of the leather if you want to make something that is relatively uh, supple and you know, someone can actually wear because, uh, you know, animal skin is is thicker if you don't do that process and it's just too rigid, that just too heavy that people couldn't actually wear it, right? Um, the idea is that you uh, you take a, a, a full piece of leather, so leather, I have, have an image here of that, and you split it at different heights based off of the kind of effect that you want to leave on the surface. And so you wind up having different names for these different um, cuts of leather that is possible. Uh, and uh, the one that is, uh, ooh, this one's beautiful. Oh, I love this one. Never saw that one before. That's a great image. If you guys look, so at the surface of leather here, so this is like on the outside, right? This is the surface of the animal itself. Um, 
at the topmost layer, like our skin, there is, of course, a very interesting pattern there that kind of forms over the surface, right? And so leather that still displays the animals, like minute bumps and uh, wrinkles and everything that was there, is something that we have a tendency to call full grain leather because it has the full uh, grain of the skin of the animal that is left intact, right? So that we call full grain leather. All the bumps at the surface of the skin are still preserved. Uh, that were there are, are still preserved. And so you wind up having a surface that's very, very rough, has a lot of, very, a lot of personality, but it's very, very interesting, right? Um, but sometimes that's not necessarily desired for whichever reason, often because of someone just doesn't want it. Sometimes the skin is damaged. Maybe the skin doesn't look as good as it could. Uh, and so sometimes that very top grain layer, the very, very top there, uh, gets uh, kind of removed. Um, but confusingly, you still wind up having something there that is called top grain leather. So it happens that leather sometimes gets cut like this. You have the full grain here and it gets cut right under the surface here. You're still in the grain level, uh, but it's cut right on, under the surface. And the result of that is that you wind up having a surface that has a lot less of these bumps there. Depending how deep of a cut you are doing, you may or may not wind, wind up with a surface that is very, very smooth or a surface that still has a bit of that bumpiness in there, which is why I really particularly like this particular image here. You know, this would be like typical top grain, you know? I don't know that that's what it is, you know? I suspect that this isn't, but um, this is kind of the distinction that you would ha have between full grain and top grain in a lot of cases there. The top grain one, uh, there is still a bit of imperfection there, but it's been kind of, kind of removed sort of thing. And it's also cheaper because, um, you know, pieces of leather, first people will make the full grain pieces with the leather that they have if they're able to, but if the grain's a, a little bit damaged, there's a chance it's going to turn off like this as full, uh, as top grain leather. Um, so top grain leather is a bit cheaper because of that than full grain leather. A typical piece of full grain leather really has only the, the top part of the skin of the animal there. And so the part that is under that, that gets literally split by a machine, is called split leather. That is the part that is left under there. And uh, now you could be like, okay, so what does split leather look like? Well, for me, split leather um, is in a way another name for suede. Uh, it is the deeper part of the animal where the skin is not as well structured in terms of its uh, collagen fibers and where the, uh, the fibers become a bit more sort of intertwined in a very messy way, which is what for me gives uh, the suede material such a, uh, a nice kind of almost like piling uh, on the surface. Now, the piling is um, usually... Uh, increased by sanding, but even at its most basic representation, suede or split leather, if you will, um, has a very rough finish that's very disorganized. This one's super interesting because this is suede or split leather, if you will, but you're still seeing here a little bit of the, the of the directionality of the uh, of the skin pores and stuff. It's very very interesting to look at. These are more materials that you will usually encounter when you're dealing with industrial processes because you have machines that can quite literally split apart the skin of the animal. And that's why when you watch this here, you, you, you can see the machine that they used to split and you can quite literally see the split letter come out on one side. And uh, I suspect here, they call it top grain. I'm surprised. Would have thought it would have been full grain, but regardless. Um, can see quite literally that 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 splitting between suede and uh, what we more commonly call leather, I suppose. Uh, and so I want to break down for you guys a little bit about leather and the different fabrication processes of, uh, that goes within making leather there. There's really three that I consider to be important. There's probably more than that, but uh, there's three that really comes to mind. By the way, the, the role of tanning, okay, is that what tanning does uh, it's a process whereby you dissolve the organic compounds within a piece of flesh. And all that is left from after that is the collagen fibers. First of all, brain tanning, which is exactly what it sounds. 
The second one is vegetable tanning. Sounds a bit more vegan, but then again, you are dyeing animal skin uh, or tanning animal skin. And the third one is uh, just in the industrial tanning. Now, let's talk about this third one right now, because it's the least interesting one of the three. Um, industrial tanning is exactly what it sounds, you know, it's like nowadays we have industrial methods of producing leather, which uh, for the most part yields leather that is very consistent in surface detail. Um, there isn't necessarily a lot of imperfections that is left over from the manufacturing process. Um, so a bunch of videos that we can watch, of course, on Leather Dictionary to have videos of, of that. Uh, so we look for, let's say, tanning. And it yields these uh, extremely, extremely uh, uniform leather hides, I suppose. I'm not sure it still hides at that point. It's probably just leather, but still. It yields these extremely uniform pieces of leather that, for all intents, for all intents and purposes, are also extremely boring. Because um, there's really nothing all that's that's happening on the surface, you know? It's like, I mean, you'll have a surface that can be bumpy, can be smooth, depending if you're talking about top grain full grain leather, these sorts of things. Um, the idea is simply that these industrial methods give you like the most uniform leather and which I consider to be boring. So the other two uh, fabrication processes for leather for me are a lot more interesting. And those are, uh, first of all, brain tanning, which as we said, is exactly how it sounds. And second of all is vegetable tanning. And they're both there too, uh, very, very different in terms of production methods, in terms of time, in terms of result that they give. So uh, this gets gross, guys. This gets very gross. But this is what brain tanning looks like. So you kind of do something like this. You take an animal's brain, you smash it, you uh, dissolve it in liquid, and uh, I'll spare you guys, I won't go grosser than this here, but it's exactly what it sounds. You take an animal's brain, you kind of smash it to pieces, you put that within, in a in a liquid, um, and then you rub it all over the surface of the hide that you want to tan. Or you just, you just put it in there and you leave it there, you know? It is such that uh, an animal usually has enough brain to tan its own hide. That's usually how it goes. Uh, and so that's how it works in the wild, you know. You kill an animal, you take its brain, and you turn its hide into uh, into leather like that. It's like, anyone remember the Anthony Hopkins movie where he plays in there? It's called The Edge. It's like, anyone remember that movie? I don't remember that movie either, by the way. Um, but essentially, there is a moment in there where, you know, they're, they're stuck in the wild and they're out and they have to essentially do that. They have to, like, do a bunch of brain tanning so that they can have some clothes to wear. And so the result of brain tanning is uh, usually not a result of a hide that is very uniform. Uh, in fact, it's pretty much the opposite. It often yields hides or rather leather at that point. That's very, very, um, that's very uneven uh, in terms of... Uh, in terms of how it looks, you wind up having something that has a lot of splotches and discolorations and probably a lot of folds uh, in weird places and that gets cut in also different weird places and stuff. So the process of brain tanning leather usually takes about a few days uh, until you're done. But it's uh, very laborious days and there's a lot of uh, manual labor involved in scraping off parts of the skin that you don't want to keep. In this case, it looks like fur. Um, there's a lot of work involved in scraping off even more details, often scraping down until the, the skin has the desired thickness that is left over. And we can already see this is a piece of brain tan leather and, you know, you can see that it's kind of getting stretched on a rack there. Look at like how uneven the whole coloration is. You end up having all these splotches that are like uh, darker in different places. And all these tools that get used, they all leave a certain mark over the surface as well. And finally, the, the third way of creating leather that uh, exists, or rather that is probably worth to talk about, is vegetable tanning. And vegetable tanning is pretty much everything that brain tanning is not. Uh, it involves tanning using vegetables, of course, uh, or trees of, or, or, or bark of trees, these sorts of things. And the process of vegetable tanning is something that, as opposed to take only a few days, is a process that will take uh, a few months, if not a few years, even. But 
What it does is that it gives you something that there too is a lot more uniform. In terms of uh, color, in terms of uh, detail, there's less stretch marks involved, these sorts of things. It's a lot more gentle as a process. But you can see that you still wind up having a certain texture left over. So you end up having stuff like this here. So, you know, it's interesting. There's a bit of texture to it. It's not uh, completely uh, free of details. Um, but at the same time, it's not usually as uniform as this is. Now, this one is a bit more... There's a bit more variations there, which I really, really like, you know? But often, like, you'll, feel, you'll find that vegetable tanning has a bit more variation because it still involves a lot of manual labor. It involves taking these huge hides and still dipping them within these, um, these liquids there, but it's usually done using traditional means, so you don't have as, as good means uh, to sort of shake around the, uh, the pieces of leather in there. So you, you still wind up having a certain amount of variation there that I think is really, really interesting. So other than that, leather, um, we'll also have different types of finishes, okay? Because leather is not often a material that is only um, one substance, so to speak. Leather gets treated, and on top of the animal skin, you wind up having a whole bunch of stuff that gets added often, you know? So you have here, uh, you know, if you take a look, this is really, really interesting. So first of all, there is something here you know, if we look at this cross-section of a finished leather product, there is, first of all, something here to call the aniline color. Now, this is the color in which the piece of leather has been uh, tanned. Um, and uh, different tanning agents will lead to different colors. So when you see videos of leather and uh, something like this happens, let's go back to that video that we had. Uh, Roger, let's go for chrome tanning. The whole tanning process is essentially taking an animal's hide, putting it in this bath that has this very acidic content, uh, and uh, just waiting until all the organic materials have dissolved there. Uh, but depending on which agent you use, you may wind up having a different color for the letter when it comes out of that. And that's what we call the aniline color essentially. So if, if you see that term, that's where it's used. Under the surface, it's actually kind of grayish, you know. It's not necessarily tan colored the way that uh, untreated leather kind of looks there. It's actually grayish because it's probably been, you know, tanned in a substance of some kind that gave it a, gave it a gray aniline color in the end. So there's that. Uh, then on top of that, you often get other stuff added on top, but most notably, the thing that gets added on top is these two things here. First, you have pigment. So what color will the final thing actually have? And then finally, on top of the color, uh, you have a top coat of some kind that is usually, it can be wax, it can be oil, something to seal the material so that water does not go in there. So all these different agents that get used at different levels will all contribute to giving you leather that has different colors, different visual properties, these sorts of things. So let, let's look at a few examples of that again. If you scroll down here, you'll find like a bunch of really nice references. And uh, you'll start seeing something like this here. This is one of those cases where the top color, the top color coat was something that was kind of grayish, bluish, right? But you can see that the leather is turning tan. And that's the color of the suede that is punching through. And, and, and that suede is still colored, which whichever color was used in the tanning process. So the aniline color there. Here they talk about the idea that uh, this kind of car here, this kind of car seat was given a blue color coating, uh, but that it was essentially created uh, with chemical agents of whichever kind that have left a yellowish to tan color for the suede that is underneath that or the leather that is underneath that and so as it gets aged then you have that color that starts to expose itself right so there too you have a lot of chances you have a lot of uh opportunities to play and create very interesting materials really novel color combinations for these two things and then finally on top of all that uh there is often a top coat of some kind that gets added and the role of the top coat is to seal in the leather so that the leather uh, becomes uh, impermeable to water. This is leather where the pores have been sealed off. Water cannot penetrate in there. This is uh, waterproof leather, essentially. 
But you can also have untreated leather where there simply has not been an, uh, a top coat added to it. There hasn't been wax applied to it. There hasn't been anything else applied to it. And so suddenly now this material absorbs water. And this will also happen to you. Like if you have an old leather coat of some kind and leather boots do the same thing, you know, often I think it's more for like leather boots. And this is why we tell people wax your boots, you know, like add something on top of your boots so that you protect it from like water damage. So this already gives us a lot of clues that we could play with to age a material somehow. And so what happens to leather as it gets, uh, as it gets worn, as the top coat starts to fade away? Uh, and if there wasn't any top coat to begin with, then this would happen a lot sooner there, right? What happens is that at some point, the leather starts to absorb oils. As a consequence, the leather starts to turn shinier and starts to turn dark. That's why when you have leather pieces like these, uh, and you know, like you'll see this on wallets, you'll, you'll see this on like, uh, on like other stuff, right? Like those gloves here also sh kind of show that there the places where uh it it's getting more worn you know like the wear and tear if you will of the leather will eventually uh take the the coat the top coat off and you also start at the same time to expose more of the aniline color that is under there then eventually um the leather also starts to absorb oil and then it will eventually turn black and what you will actually be left over after the blackening is done, like the final state of letters is a cracked leather where the color black has actually started to turn white and a lot clearer like this here. So leather goes through these different uh, states of wear like that, that are very, very interesting. And you also have a lot of details that are often left over from the manufacturing process, right? Like this is a bag that has been where the letter has been made using these artisanal approaches. Now the surface is nice and smooth, but you can still see a few things there. This is actually uh, the kind of detail that you'll probably see that is left over from like a, a scar that the animal probably had in the beginning, right? Number two are scrape marks. Uh, scrape marks of tools of some kind that have been used to either sand down the top grain of the letter, because this is top grain, uh, which makes a lot of sense because we're looking at top grain right now, right? We don't see the full grain of the animal there, but this also looks like it's been artisanally made. So the surface had to have been scraped off in some way, shape or form here, but it's been scraped off in a way that's relatively gentle because the surface is very, very smooth, but we still have some of these scrape marks that are left over, which uh, I find very interesting, you know? Um, and then uh, you have places where uh, you can quite quite literally see the grain of the animal that is getting separated off from the underlying suede. Um, and it starts to create these kind of nice little lines here. You know, there's this separation that starts to happen between the, the grain and, and the suede uh, in different places there. And uh, I've actually read up on that. Here's another image of that. Damage, wear and tear, I suppose problematic fabrication processes uh, can lead to this kind of effect where you start to literally have the separation between the, the grain and the suede that happens naturally. So you don't need to use a machine for that. You can just let it do its own thing. Understanding all these things uh, will really make you guys create better leather in the future. And I hope that I'm at the very least opening your eyes to the different possibilities, to different details, to different mix of uh, details, material properties that you can give to your letter.